Hello everyone, welcome to Writer's Routine, Random House Live. Uh, my name is Megan and I am an associate at the, in the social media department here at Random House and I will be speaking today with Tess Gerritsen, who is the author of The Shape of Night. Um, so we're just going to wait for her to join our little live party here and then I will be able to pull her in. Hi! <laughs> Hi! <laughs> There you are. How are I you? I am here. Hello. Um, hi. Do you want to introduce yourself to our, our viewers and tell them a little bit about who you are and, and what you write? Sure. I'm Tess Garretson. I'm a crime writer, and my most recent book is The Shape of Night. But I'm probably most known for the Rizzoli and Dial series. That's true. Yes. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that one. Um, so you, you have you know, made a name for yourself as the author of Rizzoli and Isles, and you've written a, a bunch of other standalone novels of which The Shape of Night is one. Um, what makes The Shape of Night stand out as, as the, you know, your most recent one? What sets it apart from the rest of your novels? Well, it's very different. It's a, it's a bit of a ghost story. Um, and it's about a troubled woman who um, moves to Maine because she's fleeing something that she's done in the past. And she moves into an old sea captain's house where the long dead sea captain is still living, or at least his ghost is there. Um, so it turns into what I like to think of as a ghost and Mrs. Muir type of tale, but with a really scary twist in that um, women have died in this house and she doesn't know if the ghost is responsible or if there's a live killer involved. So I, I wanted to, I think what was different about this was I was bringing in both crime and um, my love of old ghost stories. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a perfect intersection of those two, those two genres. Um, so what inspired you to sort of write in that one little corner between crime and, and ghost stories? Where, what was the inspiration behind the book? Well, I grew up hearing ghost stories. My mother saw ghosts when she was a child in China. Wow. Uh, she, she firmly believed they were real because she had seen them in, in various situations. And I remember when I was growing up, I said, how come I've never seen a ghost? And she said, it's because we're in America and America is too young a country. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then I moved to Maine, uh, where the book is set. And we are rumored to be the most haunted state in America. And I don't know why. Um, but maybe it's because we have a lot of very old buildings here. Uh, and, you know, in my little town of, of 5,000 people, I, I know I could probably point out 10 supposedly haunted houses. Um, so I feel like I'm surrounded by history, by sea captains, uh, and by this, this seafaring past that comes into the story. Mm. Yeah, and, and it is set in, in a, little, a little town. What, what part of your little town inspired the town in the book? Are there any um, real life places that, that inspired you to put them in the book? Well, you know, I live, I live right on the ocean. It's, it's really pretty much a tourist town. So it's the kind of town that, that Ava moves to. What we do have, uh, we have a lot of sea captain's houses here. And you can recognize them by the little wid the widow's walks on top. We have a long history of, uh, uh, of sea captains living here, building, ho building homes and building ships. So um, I think that that was most inspiring. But also what's inspiring is the, um, I guess, the secrecy of small towns. Um, when you get into a little town, people know things about the past that newcomers don't know. They keep these secrets among themselves. They're very uh, curious, and it's everybody's in everybody's business. So <laughs> um, I, I, I thought that that was a really fun environment to throw a newcomer into. In a way, Ava's sort of like the fish out of water. She's from away, and she comes to this town where everybody knows each other, and everybody has a romantic past, and, and everybody has a secret. So she has to work her way through this little town and figure out what's really going on and why people are dying in her house. Right, right. That's fascinating. I love it. Um, your protagonist, speaking of Ava, is a cookbook writer. And there's a lot yeah. of food that's, uh, that's been blended into this story. Can you talk a little bit about what inspired you to, to weave that element in and, and where you found all the, the recipes? Well, my father was a, was a professional cook. He had a restaurant in San Diego. So I grew up um, with, with a family that knew how to cook. We appreciated food. And so much of my childhood has to do with the meals that he or my mother would put on the table. And um, I, I love, I actually love cooking myself. So um, I would think I was just bringing in my own background of what it is to be in the kitchen, what, you know, how sensual it is 
to stand there chopping onions. Um, you know, the, the sting in your eyes, the sound of the board, and, and then the tastes and the flavors and the smells of the kitchen. Um, in a sense, I mean, this is making Ava, I think, I think it builds her into a, a different kind of person. She's very aware of, of things that taste and smell. And it also becomes important because a lot of the book is very sensual. Um, you know, there's, there's a love story. There is what is it like to sleep with a ghost. Um, and, then, and there's also how much food is so important to her. Yes, that's great. I love that. Making me hungry thinking about all of the <laughs> lovely food. Um, so speaking of food, do you have any specific dishes that you would eat or have little snacks that you have on your desk as you're writing? Is that part of your, your larger writer's routine? No, it's not. I'm, I'm trying to watch my weight. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I don't have snacks on my table. I, I, maybe a couple of bars of chocolate every so often, but, that, but that's it. Uh, when I, and I'm a savory type of person. I don't go for mm. sweets. So when I need a snack, it's like potato chips <laughs> or popcorn, something like that. But I mean, when I think about favorite foods, I, I am, I'm non-discriminatory. Let's put it this way. I go with all genres and all, all ethnic types and um, since I grew up in San Diego, Mexican food is sort of my childhood food, that in Chinese. Um, and I have wonderful memories about how food has really, it really connects you with your own past and with your own culture. Um, my grandmother didn't speak any English and she lived next door to uh, a Mexican woman, Mexican American woman who didn't speak any English. So they couldn't talk to each other, but they taught each other recipes. And that oh. is how in so many ways, food is, is a way of communicating, especially between women. Yes, wow, I really love that story. That's beautiful. Um, so if you're, not, you're not chopping on any potato chips as you're writing, but what, no. is your general, <laughs> what is your general writer's routine? How do you set up your desk? What, do, what gets you into the, the right headspace to start writing? Uh, coffee. <laughs> 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 I, I, you know, I get to my desk probably, oh, about eight in the morning after having breakfast and, um, I think what gets me into the right writer space is having had a good day's writing the day before, mm. um, where I leave off at a spot where I can't wait to get back to the story. And that doesn't always happen. Sometimes it's a struggle. You, you know you didn't have a good day the day before. You get there and think, oh my gosh, I don't know what my next scene is, or I don't know how to convey this. And um, it can't be emphasized enough how difficult it is to write every day and keep that forward momentum going. Um, I ha I, I'm really much a fits and starts person. There'll, there'll be a period in the plot where I know exactly where I'm going and, and then there'll be days where I don't. So some days I'll, I'll turn in you know, eight pages and some days I'll be lucky to turn in one. Um, it's, it's all a matter of how the story's going. Right, is there anything that you, any advice you have for someone who does have writer's block and isn't quite in that right space yet? Is there a way to break out of that to, to get to those eight pages a day? Well, there are, you know, there are a couple of, <laughs> I'm a medical doctor, so there are a couple of neurological things that you can do um, to get through block of any type, any kind of creative block. And, and this is, um, you know, it really goes back to that saying Eureka, where the guy figured out how to measure the volume of gold by sitting in this hot tub. Um, the truth is there are, there are several neurologic ways that do it. One of them is to do something that's kind of boring, that takes your mind away from the thing you're struggling with, but in the meantime, your subconscious is still working at it. So for me, it's driving. It's driving for a long distance, um, knowing my way, not having to focus too much on the driving, because I find that my, my brain is actually thinking about the plot issues. Um, any kind of transportation where I am not forced to think hard, like being on a train ride or being on a bus ride, those are really, really good for getting through writer's block. Um, and then there's the old tried and true, lie on the couch and stare at the ceiling. I do that too. Um, but I often find that when I'm blocked, I need to st step away from it. I need to go away for maybe a couple of weeks and do something different. Um, because the creative mind is always working even when you're not aware of it, including in your sleep. And there are times when I wake up and I've I figured out what the problem is. I saw um, one question scroll by in the comments. Do you have one writing free day a week? So do you build writing free days into your schedule or is it very much when you are ready to write, you're ready to write and when you're not, you're not? Yeah, I don't have a schedule. I <laughs> and, you know, it also depends on how close I am to deadline. Um, if I'm close to deadline, I am writing every single day. 
<laughs> if I, if it's like a year away, um, I'll spend my time in the garden or, you know, doing something else or traveling. Um, so it's, it's not that I, I write in free days. It's usually I'm forced to take a free day because I can't figure out what to write that day. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That makes sense. Um, I do. I do do one thing that's peculiar. I suppose um, that's peculiar compared to other writers in that I write my first drafts with pen and paper. Wow! And I know it's so old-fashioned, um, <laughs> and it's not that I can't type really fast. I am an. I am a really fast typist. It's just that when I stare at the screen, sometimes I feel that it's a it's a barrier between me and the story, but there's no barrier between me and the paper and mm. that pen in my hand. And I just feel like, again, getting back to neurology, there just seems to be a more direct um, connection between me and the story when I'm holding a pen. Wow, and so you do the entire first draft by hand? With pen and paper, and then I type it in myself because nobody can read my handwriting. I have to <laughs> And that gives you another chance to go over it again, right? It's almost right. like you're writing it. Exactly. Yeah. When you're typing it in, in a, in a way, you're doing the second draft as you're typing it in. Um, and, right. and you're seeing the flaws as you're doing it. I, I think part of the issue also is that when you see your words on the screen, for me, um, I want them to be perfect. I try to mm -hmm. perfect them. And that will stop me from forward motion because I'm there perfecting the same sentence a hundred times and I never get forward. Um, right. So I, that's, that's part of the, the joy of, of writing with pen and paper. And also, the other peculiar thing is I only work on unlined paper. Wow. <laughs> if it's lined, then I feel like I've, I have these constraints. But if it's completely blank, I can write sideways, I can write in the margins. It just, it just feels like you're freeing yourself up more. Um, in a way, it takes it back to childhood when we used to play as children with crayons and paper. Um, that's the way storytelling is for me. That's amazing. I love the, the visual of just like a blank piece of paper that you then get to fill up entirely however you want. I, that's right. wonderful. <laughs> um, are there any uh, TV shows or movies that you watched or, or, you know, walked away from writing this book to, to look at and then it sort of inspired The Shape of Night or any Not that you recommend in general? Well, I mean, I think what inspired it was my, I used to love the, the old, the old TV show, The Ghost and Mrs. Muir. I mean, that was really yeah. a lot of what had happened. But I think what also helped was, was when I was um, younger, I used to love Gothic novels, uh, mm. maybe in my early teen years. And for those who aren't familiar with what the Gothic novel is, it's really about a woman, a house, and a secret. Um, and there's usually romance involved. There's usually some kind of a brooding hero in there. So I was, I was playing off the Gothic novel when I was doing this story, except but I do have the house, I have the woman, but what I, my hero is brooding and not, and I'm not alive. <laughs> so that in a way I was, you know, combining things. It, it's one of these cross genre, I don't know what to call it, books. Um, but it was something that I just felt like I had to write at the time and it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's fun to blend those genres and not feel constrained by lines on a paper or by genre classifications, yeah. right? Yeah, and so I don't know what you would call it, but um, I think that by the end of the story, people are going to are, are going to have various interpretations of what exactly happened. Uh, it depends on whether you believe Ava is a reliable narrator, um, mm. whether you believe she actually saw what she saw, or whether you believe that this is all a psychological reaction to guilt, because she starts off this book feeling an enormous sense of guilt that really burdens her throughout the story. So interesting. Everyone, this is uh, The Shape of Night. If you missed the title earlier, it's a very good book. Highly recommend. Um, we have a couple questions here I think we can maybe get to. Okay. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> Why can't I hear anything? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so what else would you recommend for anyone who's looking to break into to being an author? Do you have any advice for, for future writers who are looking to sort of make their, make their break into the industry? Yeah, well, I think that number one is to write a great book. And how do, you, how do you distinguish your book from every other book? I think that really what makes the difference is character. Um, you can tell a murder mystery many different ways and they'll all sort of blend together. But what really stands out for most of us is who is the sleuth and what makes them special. So um, for a lot of my books, I find that I can't start the story until I can hear a character talking to me. I can hear their voice. 
Um, and, I, and that gives me so much insight into who they are. Are they young? Are they old? Do they have an accent? Um, and and what, what kind of a voice is it? Is it a kind voice or is it a creepy voice? So um, once that voice starts talking to me, I feel as if I have an entree into the story and that that's the person who's going to tell the story for me. And do you have any, any ideas of where those voices come from or are they just sort of, do you wake up in the middle of the night with them in your head? Um, sometimes it's just a sentence that occurs to me and, and how that sentence is, is told to me. Um, I, I'm just thinking about some of the sentences that I, I remember there was a book called Vanish where the story starts off, my name is Mila and this is my journey. And I knew it was a young woman and I, and, and I just ran with it. I thought, Mila, tell me your story. What horrible thing happens to you in the prologue? <laughs> Which is what happens. Um, so, so, and, and sometimes I think the best voices are the ones that are not at all like you. They're very different from you because then it's, it's like you, are, you truly are being guided into a, into a new landscape, a foreign landscape. Um, and your guide is, is, your, is the character you're following. And it's so different from you that you, it's really a voyage of discovery. So I would really recommend that first time writers or writers who are trying to start with a story and are having trouble getting started is wait for the voice to talk to you. Is it, and, and, and listen to who that, that person is and why are they talking. Discovering all about them in order to write about them. Right, right. Right, right. Um, okay, what do you have coming up? What are you working on that you're excited about? Can you share any details about your next projects? Yeah, well, I'm working on um, another Rizzoli and Al story. Um, and it's told from a slightly different perspective. It's, a lot of it is told by Jane's mother. Um, so Jane's mother, um, Angela, um, she lives in a neighborhood. She's been in this neighborhood for 30 plus years. She knows all her neighbors and, she, and she's a busybody. So the story, it starts off with her noticing things about the neighbors across the street, and she's not sure that's legitimate. Um, so it's, it's kind of this interweaving of a real, of a crime case that her, her daughter is solving, and Angela, who thinks she's seeing something go on. Um, and it's also about mothers and daughters. You know how it's unfortunate, but sometimes we don't give our mothers enough respect we don't realize they're wiser than we think they are. We could discount them because, you know, we're in the real world, we're working, and mom, she's just a housewife. Well, mom sees things too. So I wanted to, I wanted to explore that relationship between Jane and her mom. That's wonderful. Where did the, um, the inspiration for Angela's voice come from? Did she, did she talk to you directly? Was she always kind of in the back of your head? She's always, talk, she's always talked to me directly. I, I, see, I used to have a, you know, it, there's something about moms who are smart, I don't know if I can say the word smart asses. <laughs> Moms who know a lot um, and, and are ignored. Um, so I, I got this out of, I got this feeling about who Angela is. She's, she's a fiercely protective mother, but she grew up with a, you know, a sexist husband. And she's, she's been with a sexist husband for a long time. And, and so she's just finding her voice now that she's gotten rid of her husband. <laughs> now that she's divorced, she's coming into her own. And so it's, it's kind of this re-empowerment of a middle-aged woman after being, you know, sort of had a thumb on her all these years. Interesting. That's so exciting. I see all your, all your fans in the comments are very thrilled to have another Rizzoli and Isles book coming up. Um, in the meantime, and in addition to The Shape of Night, do you have any other book recommendations that you'd like to share with our, our viewers? Anything that you've read recently that you've really loved? Well, there's a new book out that um, I, I, it's, it's part of a series. It's uh, the heroine is, um, is named uh, Rachel Marin, and the author is Jason Pinter. Um, and I, I really, you know, I really enjoyed that heroine because another one, she's like one of these, another strong character um, who overcomes adversity and becomes a, um, I guess you could say a champion. Um, I, I think there's something about women who come back from being the lowest of the low. I mean, it's, it's really kind of the Harry, it's like the Harry Potter phenomenon. The boy under the cupboard becomes the most powerful wizard on earth. That, right. journey, that, that journey, yeah. That's great, that's fantastic. Everyone writing down these book recommendations as we go. Um, I think we are almost out of time, but do you have any other fun tips you'd like to share as we close out? Um, I think the number one thing about writing um, for those who want to become published is you just have to keep at it and you can't give up. It's so easy to get a couple of rejections and then say, well, this is not for me. 
I mean, I had a drawer full of, of rejections before I sold my first book. And every book you write, even if it doesn't get published, you've learned something from it. You've learned something from the act of having told that story. So um, I think keep on writing those books. Yeah, maybe the manuscripts will pile up in your, in your closet, but someday you're going to use that idea in a future book. Right. Oh, that's such perfect advice to end on. <laughs> thank you so much for chatting with me today. It was lovely to see your face. And thank you for everyone who just tuned in. Uh, this will be saved on our IGTV so you can hear back all of these great tips and book recommendations we discussed today. Thank you very much. Thank you much. very much, Tess. Bye. Bye-bye.